for professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 709 on CJD. Welcome to today's Entrepreneur, a program about the entrepreneurial spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with my co-host, Fuller Landau's Josh Miller. How are you, Josh? Always excellent, Dan. Had a good Easter, good Passover. Great holidays and kind of happy they're over, but you know, it's holidays and tax season, so <laughs> they go hand in hand. Should be fun. And this evening, we're profiling a uh, notable Quebec fashionista. Mariouche Gagné is the founder of Harry Canna, and she's on the program tonight. Mariouche, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so your voice hopefully is going to hold up for the whole hour. Yeah. Uh, later in the program, we're going to talk about uh, some IT issues uh, with Kevin Ammerman, some connectivity issues, but for now, uh, we, we go to Mariouche and talk about Harry Canna, which is a really unique, uh, a unique uh, design house. And uh, I think, Dan, what the listeners are going to appreciate is a, the uniqueness, it be the environmental aspect behind it, which Mariusz uh, holds very close to her heart, and she truly is uh, an entrepreneur in every sense of the word. So welcome, Mariusz, and perhaps you can tell us and tell the listener exactly what is Harry Canna today. Uh, Harry Canna today is this uh, eco luck brand, and we recycle fur, and we recycle wedding dress and cashmere and silk. We recycle all sorts of noble material. And we have a store in Montreal, and we distribute in about 18 different countries. Uh, we recycle about three to 6,000 pieces a year, fur coats, uh, cashmere sweaters, and leather pieces. And uh, we design one big winter collection and one smaller summer collection. And we're launching the summer collection next week. Um, so that's pretty much, it's about uh, 37 people, employees in a high season, and about uh, 20 in the low season. Now, how did you get started in this business? This is recycled materials, recycled fur. Where did all this start? Actually, it started because I went to school here at Collège La Salle, right next door. It's really funny. And um, they gave me a bursary to go and do my university in Europe. But I chose a school. My bursary was $10,000, and my school was $25,000. So there was a bit of money missing. But since it was the school of my dream, and I'm an entrepreneur, I didn't think much. I just went into the school. And after a while, I called up my mom and said, Mom, you know, could you please go and sell my sewing machine, my mountain bike, my snowboard, everything I own at 23 or 22. Um, and she went to Collège Assad and saw the design, fur design contest. First prize, $16,000. Second prize, $14,000. So it was really attractive. Faxed it to me in Italy. There was no, not much internet about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I called her up and I said, Mom, I'm an ecologist. I'm a snowboarder. I'm not going to do fur. She said, you have no choice. You need money. <laughs> if, you, if you want to continue, that's what you got to do. Yeah. So eventually um, I decided to do ski wear with fur inside, ski wear and snowboard wear, because for me, fur was for, for the warm. And I just fell in love with the material and did all my designs and sent them to Canada. And a few days later, I received, congratulations, my daughter. You're chosen as one of the finalists. So I had to miss school for a little while in Milan and then run back to Montreal. How did you come up with the idea of incorporating recycling into your into your business? Because right now there's so many, you know, uh, clothing recycling boutiques in Montreal and designers who are, who are emulating you. Uh, where did the idea come from? Actually, it came from that contest. They gave me a certain amount of fur, but not enough. I wanted mm. backpacks, I wanted boots, I wanted mittens. So I asked my mom to cut her two old fur coats. <laughs> and she said yes. And uh, one of my teachers in Milan said, you know, there's lots of fur to recycle in Poland, in Russia, in Italy, in Germany. And she said, really, there's millions of coats to recycle all over the world. You should do your master degree on recycled fur. And that's what I did. How did you know it was going to be popular? How did you, was this, did you, you throw yourself out there? Did you get comments after you made a few things? How did you know that, that designing these few articles that contained little little bits of fur here and there would really go over well. Actually, I was going around Milan um, with the backpack I made with my mother's old fur coat. It became like this huge backpack was like my pillow and part of my mom. And I was getting stopped in the ski slopes. I was getting stopped in, in shopping malls. I was getting stopped in fashion shows in Milan. Everybody was asking me where I got my bag. And when I was saying that it came from my mother's old fur coat, it was even more of a, like it was a riot. So, so really, um, I found out that the, everything that was done in fur was quite old and out of fashion. And that with my 23 years 
old eyes of a fashion designer, I could really create new things that never have been done before. Funky accessories, cool and warm things for skiing and snowboarding. Did you look around to see if there really was any competition at the time? Actually, in, in Italy, there was uh, there was a, a bit of a startup, and, and in Copenhagen, there were starting to be younger designers uh, like Jean-Paul Gaultier that were using more funky stuff in fur. Uh, but there was not much done uh, a few years ago. So this, Dan, is, is, you know, we talk about passion of entrepreneur and following the, their heart and their head and their soul. This story is all about that. And now that, now that she's gotten her, her feet a little wet and designing these things, now it's coming back to Canada. So when we come back after the break, it's how did Mariusz, the entrepreneur, and how did, how did Harry Canna get started? Where in Canada? We'll talk about locations, and we'll talk about some interesting marketing efforts yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Today's Entrepreneur continues with Mariusz Gagné, founder of Harry Canna, in a moment at 7.15. CJD. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Seven eighteen on CJD. Welcome back to today's Entrepreneur, inspiring stories from outstanding business people. Dan Delmar, along with Fuller Landau's Josh Miller, and our guest this evening is Marius Gagné. She's the founder of Harry Canna. And we were where we left off. Dan was okay. She's does, started designing these wonderful accessories using recycled fur, and now she's coming back to Canada. Now she's now Marius. She's coming back to Canada and saying, "Where do I start? I want to have a business. I want to start." Perhaps you can take us there, Mariusz, and kind of tell us exactly how it started here. Actually, it is after school. You you come back and you have your diploma in your hand, and, and I won another contest in Japan, and I went I went to learn about fur in, in Copenhagen. So <coughs> I came back, and, and I took my whole family's furs, uh, grandmas and Shikutimi in Quebec, and designed my first collection that I had uh, done for my master's degree. And I'm from Quebec, so I went to see Simon's. And I, instead of giving me one order, they gave me four orders. So I was, oops, I have to make all this now. Were you manufacturing, I guess, here? You were doing it on your own, or you had a couple of sewers? or Nothing. So I called up my f- one of my good friends, Jean-Pierre Marchedon. His father has a shoe manufacturer in, in uh, Outremont. And I asked, you know, do you think your father would leave me their shoe manufacturer at night? So every night I would just go and s- make my Simon's order in the shoe manufacturer and ended up having enough money to buy my first machine, my second machine, and rent my, my loft on Saint Laurent. And, and at, after that, to f- uh, found the business, I, I worked in bars at night to be able to pay for the startup and mm-hmm. get a little bit of money here and there. Was it, was it a quick growth period? I mean, now that you're, you're some 40 some odd employees during high season, uh, was it a quick growth period? Did you, did you start hiring people soon after? Did the order start coming in? How did that progress? Really, really quick. Um, I think I, it went too fast. Um, I started doing trade shows in the States and came back with tons of orders. I, I, I started getting into lots of holds and all the chains here in, in Canada. It went really fast. And, and learning how to run the manufacturing part, the designing part, the distribution part for a period of time at 25, I had 25 employees, a day shift and a night shift. So I was just working day and night. It was too much. Where did you get your information? If you, you know, if you weren't running a business before in your in your previous life, how did you gain the information? Did you have any mentors or any colleagues or that you could bounce ideas off of work with? Actually, um, my friend Marchildon, whose father was into the business and he had a belt business, helped me out. A few friends helped me out, but really, most of my friends were starting up in life too. So, so I I did make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. Is there any that you kind of learn from that kind of stand out in your mind saying, I'm never going to do that again? I guess I, there's just so many. Um, <laughs> we'll take uh, one or two yeah, for now. I, I think finding the wrong partners at the beginning, having the wrong business partners was one of my biggest mistakes and one I paid the, the biggest price for after that. Doing everything on my own, manufacturing, distributing, doing everything. When I started subcontracting part of my production, I liberated myself to do what I was the best out of, which was design and, and PR and, and marketing and, and sales. Uh, doing the manufacturing part was really hard for me because I didn't know how to run a workshop. 
Was it hard to give up some of that control since from the beginning it seems like you're used to taking on everything yourself? Was it hard to delegate? Not that much. I guess I was I was kind of glad to find out my strength and my weakness and and find people that were more much more stronger than me at manufacturing. And uh, and, and it did help. I, I, there's not much I, I have a hard time letting go except the design part. I think that's the really the part I love the most and the part that's really hard for me to let go. Are you open with your team, with your employees? Do you share a lot? Are you transparent with them? I think so. You would have to ask them, but I think so. I have I have some really strong girls and guys, but mostly girls in my team, and uh, s especially my general manager who's, who's been with me for 12 years, and some of the salespeople that I have have been with me for like 16 years. So I think if they stayed and if we were, we're still working together is because there's really a team work. Definitely a tribute. Yeah. Mariusz Gagné, uh, she is on today's Entrepreneur this evening, the founder of Harry Canna. More in a moment at 723 on CJD. Deals.com. Every Wednesday, <laughs> look for the best deals online and save 50%. Half price off at Auberge aux Quatre Saisons at the foot of Mount Orford. Half price off at Restaurant Fire Grill. Half price off at Chef En Vue Culinary Activities. Half price off at Palais du Chocolat. Half price off at Atlantis Gym and Conditioning Center Laval. Wednesday mornings at 10. Spend a little, get a lot at AstralRadioDeals.com. Do you look tired despite feeling rested? Clinique des Posas offers simple, safe, and affordable. Find at mobileart.ca. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered accountants, and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 725, welcome back to today's entrepreneur. Our guest is Mariusz Gagné, the founder of Harry Canna. And uh, Mariusz, we were talking about what the business is. You recycle. A fur and other clothing and you make it into something new um, how do you do that what what is the process involved like and it, it sounds like it, it would be pretty labor-intensive it is very labor-intensive because we do have to find the material and then we have to sort it out and then we have to uh, it's, it's really really long um, but the raw material doesn't cost too much um, because it's really out of fashion but uh, and we try with our creativity to make it look so fantastic and so great and so new that it's worth it and it's all made in Canada which uh, also if it's labor intensive and it's made in Canada you're not you're in you're competing with product that are made in China it's it's, it's a challenge it's, I would say it's the biggest challenge I have right now but are you really competing with those Chinese made products or are you trying to be so unique and so uh, I guess the with the materials and the products that are so well made you know there's only so much competition if somebody picks up a good uh, piece of, uh, or an article from China versus the one you made it might be made better here actually right now Chinese people are very strong at manufacturing they have fantastic laser machines they have much high tech that we don't have here so the quality is now as good or even better in China for much less for like a dollar a day instead of twenty dollars an hour so it is a very big challenge and and people don't understand how much when they're spending a dollar on my product, all of it goes into the economy here, which if they're spending a dollar on something else, maybe half of it or a quarter of it or 20% of it goes elsewhere. Is that a business philosophy that you've pretty much always maintained? I've always maintained it, but I have to, ha to, to say it's very, very hard because since I'm distributing in in Ogilvy, Ultra and True, uh, Harry Rosen's, uh, Sporting Life, all these fantastic places, they do have a whole wall of fashion accessories and I'm not the only one doing furs anymore. And there's some really great things now on the market. They're not ethical, they're not ecological, they're not, but they look good and they might be less expensive. And depending on the consumer, they may or may not care whether it's ethical or ecological or any of those environmentally friendly items. How do you find, I mean, sourcing your materials, was that always difficult to find them? How did you investigate where to go? Actually, finding the materials is actually, we almost get too much right now. Um, we'll probably, after the interview, have people trying to sell our, their fur coats to us and, and really buying them one by one by two particular takes a lot of time imagine your everything you have in your wardrobe 
that the manufacturer would have bought the yardage one by one. That's what I'm doing. So we do have places that are sorting areas where we buy it by the pound, and we buy maybe everything the Salvation Army didn't sell. We'll buy 300 coats at a time. But it's not very hard to find the fur because we're a few million people just in Quebec, and we're a few million people with everybody has an old fur coat somewhere. And I guess there's, it's also a commodity. Sometimes fur is in, it's, it's not in, it, the different types of fur. I guess the prices might also fluctuate with the type of material you're buying and when you're buying it. Yeah, a lot, because also the auctions, since fur is very regulated, if Ming goes up in the auction, some manufacturer will be tempted to use the recycled instead of the new because they can't find it in the auction. Right now, Coyote, which is uh, on all the Canada Goose and all the parka coats is back into fashion and there's not that many coyote skins available so they might want to come and use the recycle which is fine if it's recycled it's, it makes me happier but it makes my price go up in a moment we're going to throw out uh, some stats as far as uh, you know how many animals Marius has saved over the years and uh, how much fur she's used because I want to get into the social responsibility aspect of Harry Canna which I find really interesting and, and communicating that to the consumer as well. And certainly as she goes through and has research and development to see where's the next best road, what is the, what is the right thing to do in the society, in the community and certainly you know, getting getting some tax credits behind it as well while you're serving that community and while you're saving the animals, so to speak. So I think there's a lot more of the story behind uh, Mariusz and the entrepreneur as she evolves from Harry Canna, the one store, to selling in many different areas. Mariusz Gagné, the founder and president of Harry Canna. Uh, more with her on today's Entrepreneur in a moment at 7.30. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. 7.35, welcome back to today's Entrepreneur, presented by Fuller Landau, a program about the entrepreneur spirit that drives Quebec business. My name is Dan Delmar, along with Josh Miller of Fuller Landau, and our guest this evening is Mathieu Gagné. She's the founder of Harry Canna, and we're talking, Josh, about this uh, design house based in Montreal since 1994, founded by Mathieu, and how interesting the operation is. They recycle clothing and recycle fur, and Mathieu, uh, social responsibility is a big part of your model. And uh, we were discussing earlier some of the, the stats that are, that are involved with, uh, with this and how many uh, animals you've saved. You keep, you keep track of stuff like this. Yeah, we, we had to because um, it, it's really interesting for people to understand when they're buying new uh, instead of recycled, what impact it has on nature. And for me, it has a very direct impact if you're buying a new um, fur vest or if you're buying a recycled fur vest, there might be 10 animals who died for the fur vest. So... Uh, we recycled about 80,000 coats, which means there's about 15, 10 to 15 animals per coat. So it's almost a million animals that were saved by the people who bought Harikana instead of buying. I wouldn't say it's me, but the people who mm -hmm. decided to buy recycled instead of new. Well, that's that's huge. Uh, that's that's a big give back to the world, I would say, from from every standpoint. But it's not enough. It's never enough. Yeah. But you got to start somewhere. Yeah. It's just that when we see everything that there is to recycle, that, that, the, that hundreds and hundreds and millions of garments that are, that are there to recycle, I wish I could do more. Do you see the day when there will be no more fur to recycle? And then nope. where will you be then? <laughs> no, because no? fur lasts for about 100 years wow. if, it's, if it's well kept in a cold vault. So I think uh, there's, that day is quite far. Speaking of where will you be, I'm, I'm wondering, where, where is Harry Canna and, uh, you know, the, the, so many entrepreneurs, the, the decision of renting versus buying a location. Tell us, do you own or rent your locations? I own. I rented in Quebec and I regretted it. No, I, I own and I'm really happy. It's because um, one day I got a banker at the BDC that was nice enough to tell me, you can do it. Uh, if you're not paying more than X amount of money for your building, I'll finance it. And, and really that banker uh, gave me that fantastic chance uh, to buy that building and, and I bought it with my mom. And I would say if there's one place where you, you're you happy to put family in is with real estate because nobody lose. Mm -hmm. um, so so I'm, I'm mother and, and then daughter business is the building on the corner of Atwater and St. Antoine. So it's really close to Westmount and it's close to Griffintown and all these great areas. And when I bought it 10 years ago, the area was starting to pick up. And I knew it was starting to pick up, but it was really very, very affordable. And it's the best. My 
my building is multiplied by five, I wish my business multiplied by five. <laughs> well, it, it's certainly a vision to, to have a, and own the real estate. Now, when you, ha- when you have this vision and you have these new articles come out, you got to get the world to know, or at least the community, the city, uh, to know who it is and where is Harry Canna and what are you selling. So what do you do from a marketing strategy, both local and international? We do lots of things. We do fantastic parties to launch collection in our business like we're ha- having next week. Uh, we do uh, Facebook. We have press agent in Quebec and in Paris. Um, we dress up lots of uh, famous personality for sports and, and fashion and theater and cinema. We, we are really active. It's part of the job that I really like. We make fantastic catalogs and beautiful photo shoots and, and we we can go in and download those pictures from my website for the journalists easily to to do it. So we, we're really active with, with medias and we're really active with uh, social medias with my team now. Um, I want to do a Pinterest. Now it's my new thing that I want to start. <laughs> um, and, th- and really everybody, we're trying, we're a very small team and we're trying to separate who's strongest at Facebook and who's stronger. We're not at Twitter very well yet, um, but we'll, we'll have a blog or a tweet or something very soon. Well, you, you mentioned earlier in the program that you, you have the ability to delegate into a assigned task where you're not necessarily the strongest. Is this something that, you, uh, that you've that you been able to do well? You bring the right people in? Are you outsourcing or are you maintaining most of it in-house? No, some of it is outsourced. My, my press agents are outsourced. Um, and, and the Facebook we do in-house. Uh, we can we've improved it. I had a, a friend of mine who came to to coach us and and tell us better practice because we're not perfect at it. Uh, but I think that's one of the good thing with Facebook. Even if you're not perfect, if you talk to to everybody, they they'll answer you and they'll they'll tell you. And it, it's going to be an ongoing process. So, so actually, I, I I do a bit in house and a bit outside. And this is something I don't delegate that much because I I like to be. Um, to have the message about the brand uh, to build a brand and to build a luxurious brand you need the message to be really clear do you find that one type of media works better than the other in your business i would say tv i'm sorry i'm on radio but tv, <laughs> TV has, been visual. Has, has been really good because of the visual um and it did attra- attract a lot of people in, in the place and some people recognize uh, our store We've had a, a very big TV show, Annie et ses hommes, that was filmed in our place for five years. So it did have people relate to our place. Um, and magazines. Magazines are still, even if it's web magazines or blogs, blogs fashion blogs are fantastic now. They're, there's really great bloggers because you do see pictures and they'll follow up our, our fashion shows for Fashion Week. So I would say S- they're both strong. Since Montreal is such a, a fashion hub and there's so many, like you said, bloggers and fashion fashionistas out there, do you feel like you're always under the microscope that you have to please a certain community? Oh, yes. And the fact of having a brand that's now 17 years old the, and then being one of the first one to do eco product, you, we do have to deliver the merchandise. We have to make a very beautiful, beautiful shows or beautiful parties or beautiful. We do have to entertain correctly. You know, you're you're an international business. You say you you've sold around the world. Are there countries that you're that you're more particular of, or that are maybe easier to do business, or you find a better customer base? I would say Japan is one of my favorite now um, because they're they they are simple to deal with. They know fashion very well. They're they're eco conscious. Um, they're a large population, so when you you speak to a buyer. Um, um, and I really like Europe because I've, I've, I did all my studies there, so I know the market very well. I know the difference between Swiss and Italy, and, 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 I, and I do get to practice my Italian when I go there. So I, I would say you, the whole European um, community is, is fantastic for us. With the financial crisis that hit a few years ago, and certainly the recessions over the years, have you, have you found that that has affected your business? And if so, in different parts of the world? I think what affects my business more is more the temperature changing and the ba- planet be the planet becoming warmer and warmer. Um, I am a high-end product, a handmade, crafted product, so people with money keep on having money. They might buy less, but they might eventually choose a better product or something that even makes more sense, like my product that will put back money into the economy. So hopefully that's the choice they've been making for the last few years. Um, the temperature has been affecting my business much more. 
Now, it sounds, uh, as most entrepreneurs do, they have quite a vision. Harry Kanna has, has lived your vision, past and present. What is the future vision of Harry Kanna? What is next for you, Mariusz, and Harry Kanna, and what you're going to bring to the world? I'm an entrepreneur, so there's always lots of things next. Where should I start? Actually, the, the next step for me is really opening stores all over the world and finding the right partners to do that. And, and I haven't had partners in my business for the last 16 years or 15 years, so now I'm ready to find the right people. And it's going to take me probably a year. I'm, in, I'm being coached by uh, Secor and I'm being coached by Patrice Lachon, uh, who's one of my coaches, to help me out do the right, right decision, choose the right partners. But I really want people that have distribution all over the world that's going to help me open other other stores. What about in terms of products? Do you have any uh, any new trends coming out or, or new uh, new lines you're working on? Actually, we're always working on new things for summer, uh, recycling leather, recycling wedding dress, recycling silk, recycling other fantastic materials. I have a, fan a really great idea for summer that I can't talk about yet. You'll have <laughs> to... Um, that would involve the Cirque du Soleil, Ooh. but uh, but this whole idea, I'm, I, I I just got it lately, and I have to find out if it could work. But I, I, I'm sure it would, but, um, because we have to become stronger in the summer if the planet is becoming warm. Uh, but we're also working on a perfume, uh, which is a fantastic project, but it's so complicated. Mm -hmm. So com a perfume is so complex and such a then it's going to last through probably my whole entrepreneurial life, so I really have to do it right. So we're, we have the chance of having um, a perfume company, Mon Siège, who approached us. So this is really a great project. Okay. Coming up on today's Entrepreneur, uh, Marius will be here as well. Uh, Marius Gagné, the founder of Harry Canna, and also Kevin Ammerman, IT specialist at Fuller Landau. And we're going to talk about connecting your business and uh, keeping all your employees connected. That's on the way. It's 7.45. Let's uh, head over to the CJ. Kirkland, discover the treasure that awaits you. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Stories from outstanding business people, Dan Delmar, along with Josh Miller of Fuller Landau, and our guest this evening, Marius Gagné, founder of Harry Canna, and we also bring into the conversation Kevin Ammerman, IT director at Fuller Landau. And Kevin, we're going to talk a bit about uh, keeping your business connected. And connectivity, and certainly as a professional, and certainly as an entrepreneur, it's how do you remain connected? Because you have your internal people, and you have your clients, you have your suppliers. What are you seeing these days, Kevin, as the challenges, or maybe even some of the softwares that are available to meet those challenges? Well, you got to have a, a variety of tools at your disposal. You got to have a, a different ways to meet the needs of different circumstances. Um, of course, uh, email is not going away anytime soon. Um, it's, it's important and it's uh, the best way that we have to communicate with our clients. Um, the, uh, uh, but internally, there are a lot of other alternatives that you can do. You, you have a lot more control over your uh, internal environment in your offices and you can take advantage of dis different technologies. So whether it be something uh, like a, a SharePoint kind of tool that allows collaboration within your office or uh, wikis. Uh, everybody's familiar with Wikipedia and these uh, collaborative and editing environments, but a lot of businesses use them inside their own offices and allow their employees to uh, actively document processes within their offices and develop policy manuals and even work on uh, client materials in a more collaborative fashion. And this avoids the use of email and, and uh, gives a lot of people a lot more direct control and visibility over the product that they're, they're creating. And uh, does it matter the size of the enterprise? I mean, if you're a, a smaller group or a larger group, are there different softwares or different, whether it's instant, me instant messaging or email or, or some other product that might work better or worse for smaller or larger companies? Um, I'm not sure if size is the big differentiator. Um, these technologies are relatively inexpensive now. They're pretty accessible. Uh, people are generally familiar with the different kinds of in uh, instant messenger tools out there. Um, certainly, if you're setting up something like a wiki or a document management system, uh, it makes more sense. If there's a lot more people in your office, uh, you see a lot more benefits. But even in a, a smaller environment, if you're working on a sort of an evolving project that requires, you know, you to track the changes, um, a wiki or something like this that has a history to the project can be pretty beneficial. 
Now, what if you're just, you, you want to operate remotely? You have all your information on your, your computer in the office. You're the owner. You have a lot of people there waiting on you or, or looking for information. You're not there. You're traveling, whether you're selling furs in Switzerland or what have you. How do you connect into the office? You have all your information stored on your server. Is there any special route or maybe that an entrepreneur can know to work around to get to that information quickly? Again, there's quite a few ways to do this. And we're getting this question, being that summer's coming and a lot of people are starting to travel. Um, a lot of people uh, have picked up iP uh, iPads or other tablet type devices uh, not too long ago. And they're trying to use those things, uh, sort of have an excuse to justify the purchase of these fancy toys and uh, get some value back out of them. Uh, so yes, by uh, taking a look at what's stored on your server and seeing if you can move to more cloud-based technologies, that's one way to do it. Uh, it brings your office out of your office and makes it uh, accessible anywhere in the world. Also for larger offices, if you set up some sort of remote access uh, system, uh, it can definitely help with that kind of situation. You can use remote desktop or uh, VPN technologies or any number of other ways to get back into your office. And I think we'll, and we'll explore a little bit if it's easier or more difficult to set up uh, because, of course, that's the challenge in getting it up and running mm -hmm. uh, in just a moment. We'll ask Marius Gagné of Harry Canna uh, what is the one piece of advice she would pass on to today's entrepreneur in a moment. If hey. For professional advice with a personal touch, consult Fuller Landau, chartered accountants and business advisors. Click on flmontreal.com. Welcome back. Remaining moments of today's entrepreneur and our guest in studio this evening, Marius Gagné. She's the founder of Harry Canna Clothing and Kevin Ammerman. Uh, Kevin is the IT specialist at Fuller Landau talking about keeping your business connected, Josh. Difficult to set up, Kevin, these things or not difficult to set up? Do you need a professional or can you figure it out yourself? Uh, even for the, the, the simplest cloud-based kind of application, it's a really good idea to have someone outside take a look at the setup and help you out and uh, help you through the, the rough spots. Um, a lot of these free services, people are trying to set up on their own and they run into problems. Uh, it's It doesn't require a lot of time. It's the kind of thing that someone can come in, give you a couple of pointers and get you on your way. Once you've got the infrastructure in play, piece of cake and uh, the business owner or whoever's in charge of the in internal systems can take care of it. Are there free softwares? Is it costly or it really depends on what you're looking for? It completely depends what you're looking for. So um, setting up a, a wiki uh, can be free if you've got a server in place already or a SharePoint actually comes, the, a basic version comes for free with Windows servers. Um, uh, a lot of the Google Cloud apps are free as well for smaller organizations. And then as you grow and are looking for more advanced features, you can move into the paid options. And what about mobile accessibility? What about on the road from your handheld device? There are no free options. Okay, forget about the free <laughs> options. How about just the simplicity of finding something? There's, uh, again, you got to look a little bit at your situation. If you're uh, a one-man show and need some mobile access, uh, there are uh, little devices that plug into the USB ports on your computers. And what we're seeing a lot of smaller teams using are mobile hotspot devices that provide internet for, I think it's up to 10 users. And it's very high speed access. It's, uh, uh, the, the service is quite good, uh, at least in the, the urban areas. But uh, if you're the kind of person who wants to take something like this to your cottage, uh, you better try before you buy because uh, the cottage country is not very well serviced right now. So it sounds like there can be a lot of options for a lot of different people, a lot of different size companies. You just got to explore and make sure you get the right one. But there's plenty of ways to stay connected. So thank you very much, Kevin. And Mariusz, uh, as you look back upon your, I'll call it 17 years of experience and coming out of design school and creating your own your own vision and your own masterpiece, what one piece of advice would you give to today's entrepreneur? I think I think it's um, I, one of the most important parts would be not to start a business at 23. <laughs> 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 um, I think it's important to go and see how the the workplace works and, and to get values from other places and see this work well. I, I wish I would have worked at Hermès, I wish I would have worked at Chanel, I wish I would have worked in fantastic houses and get a little bit of ideas from everybody and not make all the mistakes with my own money and make maybe the mistakes with other people's money. But as long as you learn from those mistakes and you don't repeat them, that's important too. Yes, it is important, but it, I think it's, it's kind of neat to have a three four, five years of experience on the market before you start your own business and get some good coaches after that. Even if you do have the experience, you always need good coach. Thanks very much, Mariusz. A great and interesting story. Dan, I'll tell you the, the one takeaway, I mean, there's always so many, but the one takeaway that I get from today and learning from Mariusz is delegation. 
knowing when it's not your bag of tricks, knowing when it's not your strength, and being able to delegate to find the right people to take it over. A lot of entrepreneurs have a lot of pride in what they do and can have a controlling tendency sometimes as well. But when you're able to recognize your own strengths, your own weaknesses, and find the right people to delegate so that they can do a better job and the entrepreneur can concentrate on what they do best, that is a gift that is not easily learned. And it's such a, such a, an early part of, of Mariusz's career. I'm very impressed she was able to learn it, as many entrepreneurs should. And that, to me, Dan, is one of the most important takeaways that entrepreneurs should learn from Mariusz. And having uh, your personal brand mesh with your company brand, which Mariusz does so well. So, Mariusz, uh, from Harry Kana, thanks so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. And Kevin Ammerman from uh, Fuller Landau talking IT. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, you can reach Fuller Landau during business hours at 514-875-2865 or visit www.flmontreal.com. This is News Talk Radio, CJAD 800. From the CJAD 800 News Broadcast Center in downtown Montreal.